Once you've found a place like this, you want to get to know it better. At least I did. And I kept coming back again and again. There's a pleasure beach further along, but this is a business end, the fisherman's beach. There's no harbour here worth mentioning, just the beach and the sea. So when the boats come back from fishing, they have to run straight up onto the shingle. They'll tell you here they're main men, not harbour men. And working a boat on and off an open beach isn't the same thing as running in and out of a sheltered harbour. So in anything like bad weather, the boats have to stay ashore. All except the lifeboat, of course. She goes out whatever the weather. On this beach, they have their own habits of life and of work, which they like to follow, independent of the outside world, and often independent of each other. They prefer to do their own job in their own way, and they mind their own business. If they're a stranger, they may pass the time of day with you, but that's about as far as you will get. And some of them are so independent, they'll take no more notice of you than if you were a piece of old dogfish lying about the beach. In time, I began to make some good friends. Bert Collins, for instance, who runs the fishermen's stores and looks after the launching gear of some of the bigger boats. A great man for a yarn is Bert when you get to know him. One of his best efforts is the story of Bill Ring and Amos Perkins. It's worth hearing, I think, because it does show to what length some of them will carry this obstinate independence of theirs over what they consider to be a matter of principle. And this is how he tells it. Any Sunday, if you go down to the boat in Lake, you will find Bill Ring there. He's clever with those model boats. He wins championships with them all around the coast. But don't you make any mistake. That's only his hobby. Fishing is Bill's real business. It's in his blood. His family have been at it longer than anybody alive can remember, and they've all been good fishermen. Most of them have been connected with the lifeboat one time or another, but he's the first that's ever been cotton. And that's how all the trouble started between Bill Ring and old Amos Perkins. You see, Amos was dead against lifeboat. He hated them. He went to sea with his son, Eric. Now, young Eric was different. He had nothing particular against lifeboat, but of course he had to go along with his father, and the old boy couldn't bear the lifeboat, all the crew, especially Bill Ring. He used to say Bill was nothing but a toy boat sailor. But you go to sea with Bill, and you'll find he's no toy boat sailor. He's a fisherman. And there's more in this inshore fishing than you'd think. You look at it this way. You go out, maybe two miles, perhaps six or more. And then you take a look at the weather and the state of the tide. And you check your shore mark if you can see them. You've got to decide just where to slow down and shoot your trawl. If you decide wrong, you lose money and gear. You see, you don't only need to be able to handle boats and gear. You need judgment and experience to be a good fisherman. But you need even more than that to be a good coxswain. And I think Bill Ring's as good a lifeboat coxswain as you'll find around our part of the coast. So you might think when he heard all this talk from Amos about toy boat sailors, he'd get annoyed, but <laughs> he didn't take much notice. All right, he said. Fishermen should never be cocky. It might be his turn next. He might need our help. You couldn't imagine a wily old bird like Amos getting herself into trouble. But queer things do happen at sea, and Bill knew that better than most, I reckon. Anyway, that's how things were between Bill Ring and Amos Perkins. Then, one morning, there was a tidy old breeze from the southwest, and everybody was ashore. Bill Ring was short of a man that day, and the first person he saw was Eric Perkins, so he grabbed him. 
Derek didn't know what to do, but Bill did. You can't argue with Bill Wing when he needs a man for the lifeboat. a yacht, a Dutchman, I think it was, in trouble a few miles out. But Amos didn't hang around. He'd seen enough. He'd seen his own son go against him. Couldn't help feeling sorry for him in a way. He may have been a pig-headed old so-and-so, but he had his principles and he stuck to them. You see, from the time he was a young man, he never believed in Coast Guard or lifeboat. Why, he used to say, with all these goings on, a man can have no privacy, even on the high seas. Hundreds of able-bodied men just airing themselves. And what for, he says. Just in case some clerk from London takes out a pleasure boat he don't know how to handle and gets swept out of sea. What do you mean calling that thing a lifeboat? A floating pram, that's what I should call it. Well, Amos says, and what would you have us do? Do we, sis? What do they do about me when I go up to London? Do they have someone to meet me at the station and see that little Amos don't lose his way or throw himself under the bus? Do we, sis? I should let the so-and-so drown. Amos was a man of great principle. It was getting on towards evening before the boat came back. They'd have to stand by the Dutchman till he got his motor going again. Just one of those ordinary jobs that keep you hanging about for hours, and when you do get back, you're ready for a pint of beer. So when they came ashore, it seemed quite natural that Eric should go along with the rest of the crew, just as if he'd always been a regular member, of which by this time they all thought he ought to have been. But old Amos was waiting for him. He'd had plenty of time to think up what to say, and he'd got it all ready. But he never said it. All young Eric was thinking of was his beer. And he didn't even see his old dad. He went straight on with Bill Ring into the pub. You'd have thought Amos would have gone in after him and crowned him with a butler. But he didn't. He just went off home. And for six years after that, he never opened his mouth to his son. So they must have passed each other 20 times a day. As far as Amos was concerned, his son just didn't exist anymore. Six years. Of course, they split up after that. It did Eric a lot of good, too. He worked out a new boat and he got himself a new mate. And they began to do very well. But old Amos, he began to go downhill. He got himself in debt and he had to sell his old boat. Then when he'd squared himself up, he got himself a smaller one, just big enough for him and a young lad hand. Six years. Then the thing we'd all been waiting for happened and it happened the finest day that ever came out of the sky. 
It was those same Coast Guard aimers had always been so dead against who noticed his folks was behaving suspiciously. But the old man, he never showed no distrust of me. I trust him for that. Still, they weren't satisfied. So they were on a lifeboat. Phil Ring's wife brought the message up to the Fisherman's Institute. Who is it, says Phil? They think, she says, it's Amos Perkins. They had to run some way down the coast before they found him. The old fool, he'd made for Belmont when he found himself in trouble. If he had to be picked up by anybody, he didn't want it to be our boat. But they'd have run him down if he'd been making for the North Pole. They weren't going to miss a chance like this. They found out afterwards he'd stove in his side on a piece of floating timber. His bilge pump wouldn't work, so his engine had packed up. He was in trouble, all right. Bill hailed him to know if he wanted a tow. But there's one thing no fisherman likes to see, and that's another man's line across his bow. So Bill might have been singing carols for all the notice all Amos took of him. Well, thought Bill, this is a fine situation. What do we do now? Matter of fact, there was only one thing to do. Lay about and wait till the old boy come to his senses. They couldn't leave him out there in that condition. They stood by for more than two hours, just circling round and round. Eric must have felt queer, sitting there not able to do a thing and his father within hailing distance. never took his eyes off her. She might have gone at any minute. And Amos and the boy looked all in. In the end, Bill took matters into his own hands and he went alongside. just about finished. Even old Amos seemed to have had enough. But he came to again when he found somebody trying to help him. He didn't want no nursemaid. All he wanted was his boat. Bill had her on a tow line tucked up under his sound. There was still just a chance he could beat her with two fresh men if he was to bail. So he went ahead slowly, making for home. Then the mechanic got out the rum and they passed it for us. The boy certainly needed it bad. Eric took the other mug. And the first word old Amos said to his son in six years was no. No. There wasn't a man on that boat really thought they'd make it. And sure enough, after a while, they sang out it was hopeless. The water was beating them. So Bill stopped her. And he had him aboard again. They were in sight of home now, but with that dead weight at the end of the line, it would have taken them a good hour to get there. And there wasn't a hope of keeping her afloat that long, now that the water was beginning to have its way with her. 
She was wallowing now and settling fast. And they all knew how Amos was feeling. It cropped a man to the heart to see the last of his boat. But they just couldn't tow her any longer. Bit of a heartbreak, all right. He must have known if he'd taken the line sooner, they'd have got her home safe. Well, that's Bert Collins' story. If you saw the three of them today, you'd hardly know what to think about it. But then, as Bert says, it all happened a long time ago. <laughs> 